We're going to be talking with Larry Hedrick, who is the co-creator of the Superstition Mountain Museum. This man is a wealth of knowledge about the mountains up here, and uh, he's going to share some of those interesting stories with us right now. Tell us about the first time you went up in the superstitions. Well, that was, that was about 1973 or 4, somewhere in there. I had taken a class at the high school in Apache Junction called Prospecting the Superstitions. And I became friendly with the teacher that was teaching that class. In fact, I took two of them in a row. And um, he w after the uh, class was over, he took people on horseback rides through the superstitions. So we went from Peralta Road to First Water Road with about 30 or 40 people. It was amazing. I've got some pictures of the horses on the switchbacks and all this stuff. And that was my first trip through there, but it really didn't have anything to do with the Dutchman. You know, the story's been told over and over many different ways about uh, the Dutchman or the Deutschman when he was here, but uh, there's little that's known about him when he came from Germany. Uh, but you, you researched this, is that correct? Um, the Dutchman, of course, was a real person. Um, <clears throat> everything is just about, everything is known about him here in America when he arrived, except how he got to California with the 49ers. They don't know if he went around the Horn or he walked across the Ithamus or that he went overland or what. That's about the only thing they don't know about him being here. But in 2004, two doctors, Dr. Ortel and his brother, both Germans, one still living in Germany and one still here, their father was a, was a genealogist, and they'd done genealogy too, and they had become interested somehow in the Lost Dutchman legend, and they decided to try to find this guy. Now, there's been a lot of books written about Jacob Waltz, and one of them um, had, had his birthplace and all that, and they disproved this completely, so much so that the, the author removed the book from, from uh, being printed. But... Um, they have documented him to the point that there's no doubt. Uh, he was born in, in a town called, and I'll probably mispronounce some of these names, Vohen, Vohenlo, which is in the kingdom of Wuttemberg in southern Germany. Uh, first time I saw a map of it, I thought it was huge, but really it's, it's, uh, it's not all that, that big. But Vohenlo is over on the far eastern edge of Wuttenberg uh, and, and almost to the boundaries of Bavaria. And he was born in, uh, uh, I think it was uh, September 2nd, 1910, 1810. And um, his father, they've got, they, a little bit later I'll tell you how they come up with this information. But his father gave him 250 gulden to come to America. Now, Gulen was a coin that, that contained gold, and it was said to be at a substantial amount of money at that time. Um, I found out later that a Gulen is worth about um, uh, 80 euros at, the, at this date. And um, anyway, he, he left home and went to uh, Heilbronn, which was about 10 miles away, he bought a shotgun, double barrel shotgun. They got the name of the guy that sold it to him. He bought about 55 pounds of uh, foodstuffs, uh, a fur cap, and he had a box made that was what they call four shoes, S-C-H-U-E, which means a shoe, uh, being about 12 inches. So this box is about four feet long, and he had a special strap made for it so he could carry it, which I assume was perpendicular. And um, um, he, instead of paying for it with the 250 guldens that his dad gave him, he charged it all and, uh, and headed for America. But he didn't go where most Germans go to leave. He, he didn't immigrate out of Amsterdam or any places like that and left for America at La Havre, France. Uh, this led me to believe uh, that, um, and I don't know that it's true, but he must have been in a little bit of trouble. Uh, who knows what, but the, a lot of soldiers were coming home from the wars at that time. Work was hard to get. 
And um, uh, whatever trouble, maybe he was trying to avoid disconscriptions, I don't know. Maybe he had woman troubles, I have no idea. But why conceal the gun in a box? It wasn't against the law in Germany to own a shotgun. And why leave in from France instead of the normal channels that most Germans, and he did not do it with uh, legal immigration. He, uh, so anyway, uh, when he stepped off the boat in New York in uh, 1839, um, he was worth about three thousand dollars. So he didn't live because of from poverty. He didn't leave because of poverty or anything like that. Uh, he was educated at the University of Hohenheim uh, down just south of Stuttgart, and um, his two brothers were educated there. And when his father died in 1843. The money that he gave him, the 250 golden, the 244 golden that he charged, and 196 golden for his education were all held against his uh, 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 inheritance. That had to be accounted for before anybody else uh, got anything. Uh, his mother died eight years later, uh, and uh, the, the government went through his kind of what we would call probate, probate and all five of his brothers and his sister got 2,700 gulden and he got 2,100 gulden uh, and change uh, because his 600 and some gulden was held out and uh, it was never claimed. He never claimed it. And that's, that's the story of Jacob Waltz in Germany, which only a handful of people even know anything about. It's only been published in the Superstition Mountain Journal and things like that, so not that many people have uh, been exposed to, to the truth of that matter. Where did the date 1808 come from on his grave? Oh, some people believe he was born in 1808 rather than 1810. But it's, it's fairly proven that it's 1810. 1810. What got him interested in mining? Well, you know, I looked up the University of Hohenheim, and um, it was an agricultural school uh, back in those days. Today, it offers geology. Uh, a lot of rumors have floated that, uh, that uh, Waltz uh, was trained in geology. Um, but I could find no evidence that back that far they were teaching geology because it was stricken in agricultural school. But he had a degree in business administration. They wrote that down in their documentation. So uh, I don't think he, he of course didn't know anything about California back then, you know. Uh, the Indians along the East uh, were not a big problem. So why did he need the shotgun? <laughs> Who knows? But after arriving at uh, New York, he went to New Orleans, and then he went to work in the Georgia Goldfields. But that story is so well known. You know, we don't. Uh, what he what he did here after he got here is just really documented well. But nobody hardly knows anything about him in Germany. And what about his partner, the other Jacob? There's no evidence he had a palter. Uh, Weiser was the name given. Uh, they had a list of all the people that was on the passenger ship. There was no wiser. Uh, the, if, he had, uh, if he had some kind of a partner, it would have been after he got back to Arizona. He came in with one of the Walker mining parties, but he didn't go on with them to, to who discovered Rich Hill up uh, at Wickenburg, you know. He stopped in La Paz. But then eventually he come on over to, uh, to the Prescott area where he had two claims. I think it was the uh, General Lee and the Grant. Uh, <laughs> uh, what his Civil War beliefs were, I, nobody knows, but he did name them that. And it did produce some gold, but I don't think it was anything significant. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. And join us next time for some more great tales. And remember, we're actually going to be going up there and we're going to be seeing a lot of these places. So stick around. We're just waiting for it to cool down a bit. Right here on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.